Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 6 of my podcast. I'm here with puppet builder and creative designer Matt Fickner. Hello! So, uh, Matt, tell me a bit about yourself and your career. Um, well, actually, it's interesting uh, in that I got into doing professional puppet building and performing at a very early age. Um, you know, I'll kind of show you how old I am, long before the internet even existed. Uh, <laughs> I um, I would uh, I would write correspond with letters and uh, make phone calls to uh, to different people in the industry saying hey you know I I, I want to be a puppeteer and I'm I'm a builder and I'm good at stuff <laughs> and um, it it was interesting I, I ended up getting in touch with uh, a wonderful woman by the name of Noreen Young oh. and uh, she produced a lot of uh, uh, TV shows uh, in and around. Uh, my area in in Canada Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, so she had a lot of product basically out on TV and I got to do an apprenticeship with her um, almost immediately after I graduated high school Wow! and that's kind of where I got my foot in the door and so I did a number of different projects with her and then um, there was a call out for puppet designers and builders for this show that uh, sounded really interesting. So I actually, I sent in my very own like CV and uh, VHS tape of <laughs> some of my work and whatnot. And uh, the producers were like, "Yeah, okay, well your stuff is good. We're not sure you're a little young, but uh, you know, um, uh, we'd be interested in talking to you." And then of course, Noreen also had submitted stuff from her studio, which is of course a lot more uh, established and professional. And of course, I was working there. So when the producers actually uh, chose Noreen's studio to uh, to make all the puppets for Naughty, mm-hmm. um, it, they showed up and they were pleasantly surprised. That, yeah, here's this pimply faced kid. It's like oh, I can do puppets too. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and so it, it was just sort of this wonderful little uh, synchronicity of connections. And uh, you know, so Noreen and I designed. Uh, all these puppet characters and uh, it, it it was interesting because we collaborated on every single design and of course some of them were more her uh, her aesthetic and her design and then uh, a lot of them were more my design and aesthetic and it kind of was this happy mishmash of styles and uh, Rick uh, who I know you've talked to already many times yeah uh, yeah I think part of what uh, was interesting about landing this gig was the fact that they wanted something that looked a little bit different than what um, was currently on TV with when it came to puppets. You know, everyone thinks sort of soft, cute, fuzzy, um, uh, Sesame Street, Muppet style yeah. characters. Uh, but both Noreen and I have a very different uh, approach and different materials that we use to create characters. So I think that was part of the selling point of putting something out on screen that was just that little bit different uh, to make it stand out. So, uh, that's, yeah, that, there, that, that's that story in a nutshell. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's awesome. And as you said, you know, that you guys had a very different style of puppetry. The only one who was, like, sort of in the Sesame Street kind of, well, Jim Henson kind of style was, I think, Warlow Weasel. He kind of looked Yeah. Bit, and that's, you know, I think that that's great because he, he, he was a fantastic character. Yeah. Yes, I know. I know you have a soft spot for him. <laughs> yep, he's uh, definitely my favorite of the lot of them. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, so what was the process of designing and building the characters like? Um. It was very interesting. It was. Uh. We would sort of have uh, a collaborative, uh, sort of brainstorming session, and we would throw out these ideas of uh, different kinds of toys. Again, so all the characters had to be. Sp- based on some sort of vintage toy of some kind so there was some familiarity uh for the audience to pick up on Mm -hmm. and uh we would do all kinds of things and again this is long before uh google search engines and image search engines and stuff so we had to do a lot of research in finding images and pictures of like old old tin toys and old old style like Cupid dolls and stuff that was mass produced in the 50s and 60s and 70s, um, and you know, like even finding old uh, 
Sears catalogs and stuff and uh, and uh, digging through some of them yeah, to yeah. inspiration. So we would look at all these ideas and then say, okay, well, uh, we want a character. Uh, I don't just think of think of something in particular. Um, you now, like the salt and pepper shakers, you know. Like yeah, yeah. We want to have these two two characters that can give us a bit of a western feel. So if we do country music, we have kind of two country music stars and you know you sort of scratch your head well maybe they could be teacups or maybe they could be um you know well they can't really be liquor bottles because it's a kid show but uh <laughs> you know but uh then it was like oh well what about like then we would find like a a picture of like someone's collection of weird salt and pepper shakers and say like, hey that's perfect so we would then go um sort of off uh i'd sit down at my drawing board and just scribble out ideas and uh, have four or five different concepts on a piece of paper just penciled in and I would fax those off to Rick <laughs> say Here, here's some here's some thoughts here's some ideas and uh, we would get feedback and we would collaborate back and forth and then I would refine the design and then do a full color version of it and then those were kind of what were used to then sell the show idea and gave us a blueprint of sort of the look and the feel of what the characters would be and where we would go with them. So, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of how the design process went. It was a lot of back and forth, so it was, it was very much a collaborative uh, process. And uh, it, it's great because I always say, and I've heard this saying somewhere, and it's always stuck in my head, that you know, true creativity doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's always great to have influences and conversations about ideas to sort of evolve them and push them forward. So that's kind of how that uh, that process worked. Yeah, yeah. No, it sounds like it was uh, it was a complicated but you know fun and you know <laughs> I think the final designs were fantastic. Oh, thank you, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, it it was a lot of fun. It was also very challenging because because we were trying to again like. Okay, here's a salt and pepper shaker. How do you actually puppeteer it? Like, what, how, what do you do? Like, how, how, what kind of mechanism? How do you get your hand in there? And stuff? <laughs> it's like, well, okay, we got to figure out some sort of, you know, a little mouth rig and stuff. And that's, for me, that was a fun challenge too, because part of the designing and building of puppets, it's yes, you can have your traditional hand and rod puppet like Warlow, who was very much that TV style puppet. Yeah, yeah. But. Um, you know, to have to design the mechanics of some things like, you know, like Planet Pup, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, had all kinds of little bells and whistles to make his ears flap and his tail wag and, and drive around on the floor. So it was a fun engineering challenge to design uh, a way for these characters to function and how to puppeteer them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, was it was did he have a motor in him to make him sort of drive around by himself? Yeah, there was actually there were two versions of Planet Pup. There was the puppeteer version where you could puppeteer him and he, you know, could wiggle his tail and flap his ears. And then there was a second version that was the radio controlled version. And uh, uh, I was the one who was always driving him around and bashing him and things and stuff. So, so <laughs> oh. if I broke it, it's my own fault. And I had to fix it. <laughs> well, that's amazing. I didn't. I didn't seem. I didn't think there were two of them, but. It makes a lot of sense, and it's funny you mentioned the mechanisms and the salt and pepper shakers because I don't know if you know, but I've actually operated those puppets. Oh, cool! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rick, Rick still has them, but I think they were rebuilt for the second season. They looked more. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah the, some of the yeah, some of the puppets didn't survive <laughs> the first season. Oh God! Re-engineered. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just the abuse that that these things take, and uh, you know it. It's funny, people often ask me, oh, I want to want you to build a puppet for such and such, and it's like, okay, but you realize, yeah, you're going to be using it, and it's going to be beaten, you know, the heck is going to be beaten out of it, and um, people don't necessarily understand, it's kind of like a ballet shoe, you know, you use it for per performance work, and it, it wears out, it gets beaten up, and uh, yeah, so, so they're normally uh, on a lot of productions that are far more puppet heavy there's often duplicates or triplicates of, of a character um but on on naughty just the 
with the constraints of um, just budget and time, we only had an opportunity to make. Uh, I, I think the only other character that had a duplicate was uh, 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 the flamingo. Oh, okay. um, wow! Because there was a puppet puppet version of her, and then there was a stuffed version of her, so she could just be placed on set. Oh, uh, okay, that makes sense. Um, but uh, yeah, but so so so. What was nice about the way the the production worked though was um, when they were filming a lot more of the. Um, the human actors, the kid actors and stuff, uh, I was, you know, in a corner of the studio, uh, constantly maintaining and, and fixing up the puppets and, and doing repairs and building new props and stuff for, you know, the, the, the upcoming episode. So we were always like an episode ahead. Um, so it was a great, it was a great show because it, it kept, I, I kind of have a, you know, a tendency to not be able to sit still for very long. So it was great. <laughs> so it was great to be able to, you know, okay, call on set, go puppeteer for a couple hours, and then, uh, okay, uh, now that we're filming the kids, okay, great, I'm going to run in, hide behind the set, and, you know, finish gluing, uh, you know, Rusty's nose back on or something, and <laughs> yeah, uh, putting pieces together for another prop. So, uh, so yeah, so it was, it was a it was a fun and hectic. Uh, uh, fun and hectic time. That was it was great. Oh, it certainly sounds like it. Really, you know, Rick said this to me before, but he says he wishes I could have been there to see it. And I really wish I could have been. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, which um, which do you remember which characters in particular you built and which ones you didn't? I mean, I, I have a good idea, but not... yeah. So, so the the primary character. Oh gosh, there were a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so, well, Rusty and Sherman. Uh, Warlow, uh, uh, Planet Pup, um, which was his final name. He had a couple of other names. For oh, yeah. Production. Oh, yeah. We couldn't trade it, so it ended up being Planet Pup. Um, uh, Lichtenstein. <laughs> um, that makes sense. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, then, uh, my goodness. Um, there were aspects of, uh, oh, like Disrupto. Disrupto was uh, a fun character that I got to oh, build. Yeah. Uh, my gosh, I'm, I'm my brain. My brain's in a fog now. There were so many of them. Uh, and then Noreen Le- uh, built like Granny Duck and uh, um, Benita Flamingo, and uh, uh, she did uh, the, the Crybabies. Yep. And, and uh, oh gosh, what other ones did she do? There was one that I found interesting in that you drew the design for it, Gaylord the Gumball Machine. But the oh yes, that was yeah, that was yeah, that was one of my yeah, that was one, of, and that was a that was a fun and interesting puppet. He had so many uh, levers and cables and buttons to oh yeah, do stuff. yeah, you know, he was a, he was actually a functioning gumball machine. He could actually spit out gumballs yeah. on command yeah. so uh, that was a fun that was a fun design I'm sure because I know because I've operated it it still works oh cool. Yeah. oh cool yeah Rick has a couple of them he's got the gumball machines he's got the the pig cookie jars the oh yeah 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 those those pigs were yeah Noreen Noreen had built those yes it was interesting like I it's it's funny though because it's um I know like some are more clearly Noreen's design some are more clearly mine but we uh, uh, like the salt and pepper shakers again are a perfect example. Noreen designed them and sculpted them, but then I built them and the mechanism that went in them. So, so it was again, it was a huge collaborative effort, and we would go back and forth with making things work. Like with Granny Duck, um, you know, I refined and des- refined her mechanism in her head, and so there was a lot of that. Um, uh, again, we worked as a team on it. So, oh, for sure, and. Um... Um, what other, Rick also had Stein. Now that that one still yes. works really, really well, and I'm surprised. Oh my goodness, I'm surprised. Yeah, okay. he's made out of like foam or something. Yeah, yeah. How I don't know how that survived twenty plus years, but you've, you you oh, did a great job. I know. I know. Well, I I have uh, I still have Rusty and Sherman in my studio here, and uh, they've they've weathered very well. Yeah. Some some of the puppets I know have have 
have not. They've gone to the dustbin in the sky. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, well, well, uh, Johnny Crawfish was one of my designs and builds, and he was he was one of my favorite characters as well. Oh, okay, and yeah. Uh, yeah, but that that puppet is. Uh, I, I think it's long gone. I know uh, Jim Rankin, who performed him, inherited him after the uh, the show. But um, what happened with him was uh, so. Yeah, we had a separate set that was the interior of Johnny Crawfish's tank. Yep. And uh, so you know, on the practical set, on a human-sized set, you would zoom into the the tank, and then we would cut away to this large enclosed. Uh, Supersized tank uh, that would be performing in, and the thing was blown full of uh, mineral smoke and bubbles and soap, and so after, well, after every every other take, we would have to wipe down the puppet because it would just have this film of of soap residue all over it, and it was just nasty. It was just this thick, goopy mess. Oh it looked great on camera, but. It was really hard on the puppet, so I think once the puppet was sort of put into storage for a while, whatever you know solvents were in all that soap just basically ate away at it, and he turned into this mushy brown pile. Of soap. <laughs> yep. It's like okay, he's dead. Yep. It's time to have a funeral for Johnny Crawfish. Yeah. 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 Do you, Do you know how long ago that was? I'm just really curious. Oh gosh. Um. Oh my goodness! Well, that's got to be oh at, at least fifteen years ago, if not more. Um, my God! Yeah, because I, I I was working on another production in in Toronto, and I was actually uh, I was actually staying at uh, Jim Rankin's uh, place, and it was nice. I was you know basically couch surfing while we were uh, doing another short production somewhere. Yep. And uh, I remember going to say, oh, here's, here's the bin that Johnny's in. Let's check him out. <laughs> Foam is overflowing the ground. This double bubble trouble is bringing me down. It's kind of funny, but it's really, you know, it's kind of sad as well because he was a great character and the puppet was fantastic. Yeah, he was. He was a fun. Again, he was an interesting and challenging design too. You know, it's a, because it's not a traditional humanoid shape to make work, and uh, it's interesting now because you know, materials have evolved and uh, the kinds of uh, stuff that I work with now. Um, it, it, in some ways, it's like ah. God, I wish we could reboot the show and I could rebuild all these characters with all this new technology and all the new things that I know how to do. You know, <laughs> kind of cool, but you know, everything from you know silicone work and thermal plastics and uh, and 3D printing now. Like I, I'm working on some projects now where I'm designing some characters and uh, the core of them I can uh, design digitally and print out on a 3D printer, and then from that use those components to put a character together so it's kind of a fun thing to always be evolving with, oh yeah. uh, this craft oh it's amazing how far technology's gone and you were saying about uh, naughty being rebooted give me 10 yeah. years and we'll see what happens <laughs> <laughs> let's, okay let's hope for the best um so um you got my phone number yeah so. yeah so um do, do you? I've got to ask this question. Do you? You don't remember who built the penguin characters, do you? Oh uh, yeah, that was both Noreen and I built built those. Oh, okay. And, yeah, and um, yeah, I think actually th the way because it was a bit of a assembly line with a number of things that we were doing, um, it would be something like like Noreen would do. The, uh, she sculpted the penguins, but then I would cast, do the molds and cast and pour them, and then I would build the mechanism for them. Um, so we kind of had this uh, sort of assembly line of different puppets at different levels of, you know, being built, uh, and it all depended on sort of when character designs were signed off, and then we could go ahead and move. So, uh, so they were they were primarily designed by Noreen, but then they, uh, she and I built those together. 
Oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. The, the, the penguins and the lips in particular are very interesting in that they didn't actually have, like, an, an on-set voice. Because, you, you know, when they did the songs, they had people in Nashville yes. who, who were doing impressions. Yes. <laughs> but they didn't. The, 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 the voices for the penguins and the lips were solely from Nashville, which I think is really funny. Yeah. It is what well, it is. Well, I, yeah, well, the, yeah, the lips were were all my design and creation. Um, oh wow! And they they were uh, they were fun, but so it would be funny on set because of course you have the script that has the lines that the characters uh, perform, and uh, the lips, um, the way they operated. Each each pair of lips had a trigger uh, to operate them, so you kind of had to be very nimble with your thumbs to do. Okay, here's the center one, the left one, the right one. Uh, depending on which one you wanted to talk, and then you had to push them all together if they were to sing in unison. Um, and we would, of course, we would voice the characters on 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 set when we were recording, uh, you know, for timing and everything. So it would be funny. You would have, you know, the, the lips pop open. Of course, the end result uh, after editing, you've got these wonderful, very rich female voices coming out of them. But it's <laughs> funny to, it's like, uh, you know, the lips, the lips open up. It's like, hey, how you doing? What's going on? Hey, it's like to see you. Hey, you know, it's a bit odd when you hear our voices come out of something like that. Same with Benita. It was funny because uh, Frank Meshkalite puppeteered. Oh her. yes, yes, I've, I've heard. And, I've heard the raw, the raw tapes. <laughs> yeah, the raw. It's really funny too. He does this very campy, um, uh, sort of you know, almost drag queen like voice. Yeah, for the character. <laughs> which is actually really funny. Yeah. And it's kind of it's bad that that didn't make the final cut because it actually made the character that much more bizarre and funny. But anyways, it's kids TV. We can't go there. Yeah, so. exactly. Oh, unless you've seen the blooper reels. <laughs> oh, dear Lord, yes. <laughs> well, um... Oh, God. It's funny you mentioned, the, just back to Johnny Crawfish for a second, the, the, yeah. the whole bubble thing. I don't yeah. know if you remember, there was a whole song where he sings about, you know... Bubbles. It's, I think it's called Bubble Trouble, and oh it, yes, it ended yeah, up yeah. ended up being his demise in the end. <laughs> yes, the irony. Yeah. The irony of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, were there any characters that you designed that were rejected or changed heavily? Um, there were a few. Uh, there's, uh, yeah. You actually, you had sent me a um, uh, a document, and I had forgotten about some of these. So, yeah, there were some. Uh, there were uh, there was a Nutcracker chorus. Yes. That um, that I think what eventually became the penguin. Yes, uh, yes, I believe so. Um, and uh, I think I, I actually I don't remember the reasoning why they were rejected so much as I just think uh, um, I don't know, there was some, some reasoning for it. But uh, so there were those. Um, Disrupto was an interesting character. Uh, I did about. Five or six different versions of him before we settled on the uh, the, the big sort of blocky robot that he that he is now. Uh, but he he started out as like a robot dinosaur with a big mouth and teeth, and um, then something that looked a little bit more like um, uh, the robot from Lost in Space. Uh, so there there was a lot of uh, sort of vintage robot styles. You know, everything from a little Godzilla-ish to, again, that Lost in Space look. Till eventually, it became sort of the the uh, the blocky look that he is now. Um, but gosh, yeah, I'd I'd actually I'd I'd have to go digging. I have like several bins of old sketches and designs that I would I'm probably find some stuff that's like, oh my goodness, I completely forgot about that. Oh, the biggest change. Uh, to uh, a couple of puppets, they were actually Noreen's designs. Were the uh, the crybabies? Oh, um, wow! The initial, the initial uh, sculpt and head design of the crybabies, once they were first done, ended up being a little bit too horrific and scary looking. Oh yeah, they, there was just something about the proportion of their eyes and their teeth. They kind of had this uh, possessed doll from a horror movie kind of look and feel to them <laughs> yeah so uh so they ended up going back to the drawing board and ended up being more the the softer rounder um characters with just the little black pupils for eyes but uh yeah it was i just remember 
um, we were doing some test footage and the, we brought the crybabies up for the first time and from behind camera you just started his dear lord what is it <laughs> okay all right those are going back so. <laughs> oh, that's amazing oh god um it would be really cool to see some more of the concept designs because the ones i sent you i think those are the only ones i've actually seen and um yeah of all places, they came from the the composer, my friend Dennis, in Nashville, and they were part of this yeah. the song the song auditions. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I do have some. I know. I know. I do have some other ones somewhere. And uh, again, it's when when I have to have, you know move the bins around. It's got another three bins full of sketches. I gotta go <laughs> throw them in somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I get a chance to, I'll, I'll definitely uh, rifle through those again. And if I see anything, I'll happily. Uh, snap a pic or scan it and send it off your way well thanks very much that's awesome yeah it's it's just it's 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 a process process i don't fully understand because with naughty um because the the creation of the characters is sort of a bit it's a little bit like of a murky a murky sort of picture because it was so long ago a lot of people don't yeah. re don't remember it and i don't i don't yeah. blame them yeah. <laughs> uh, well it's it there there are hallmarks to how that process works and to this day it's still how uh, I like to design things and and um, again the whole idea that you know it, ideas and creativity don't exist in a vacuum you, you draw influences from from everywhere so um, again like what I would often do if I'm asked to design either characters or a setting or props or a visual style for some illustration work um, I will pull out you know books or Pinterest pages or whatever of okay here's some styles here's some different ideas here are some different artistic approaches and here's some different references of uh, uh, toys or costumes or um, uh, things of that nature and uh, what I like to do is you know it's it's it, for lack of a better um, example it's the chocolate in my peanut butter kind of you put your chocolate in my peanut butter. You put your peanut butter in my chocolate. <laughs> it's the idea of taking two, two or three or more concepts or ideas that one wouldn't think would work together, but finding a way for those designs uh, and those influences to work together, and that's what helps to create something that's a bit new and a bit different and uh, and unique. So uh, that's something that. Uh, I always try and do with everything that I create because uh, I, I'm influenced by a lot of different things and there's a lot of cool amazing things out there and uh, you know it's to always take take those inspirations and put my own spin on it that's a lot of fun oh yeah well from what I've seen of your work outside of Naughty it's very you have your own very distinctive style like I, I like some of the darker the darker sort of characters you've designed <laughs> as well they're, they're pretty cool Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. Yeah, the darker stuff is uh, that's just to help balance out when you when you're doing all kinds of kids stuff for for years and years and years. Um, you almost need to go. Okay, I can only do another cute and fuzzy uh, puppet character that's singing about sharing. I need to make a rotting zombie that's going to eat somebody's face off <laughs> just to balance it out. So. Imagine imagine if Naughty had been done in that story. <laughs> Oh. Like in, in this, like if it was a parody of a kids show, that would have been really yeah. You get this weird, weird sort of reanimator thing where the, all the toys are actually possessed by an evil spirit <laughs> of some kind. And you, get this, you know, Chucky Child's Play kind of bizarre <laughs> twist to it. Oh all. god, that that that's a scary thought. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here you got you got Rusty going. I want to play with you. <laughs> My god, you can still do the voice. That's oh yeah, that's amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. my god! <laughs> so, so uh, I I think Disruptor was a great character. He's he's a modern toy who stands out amongst all the, the antiques. Also, the only sort of antagonist the puppets really had. Yeah. Um. How yeah. how did he sort of come into the picture? Um. I think that was just it. I think the idea was to have a character that was the bully. That was. Uh, uh, sort of that, that that complete polar opposite of all the other characters um, you know there was an interesting dynamic that uh, things like you know you had Warlow who would be the troublemaker but everybody still loved him um, 
you know, and you had each each character kind of had their role, but there really wasn't an antagonist character. So it was to bring in something that, again, like you said, was somewhat of a newer toy and something that had, you know, a bit of an ego and just being very, very abrasive. Um, you know, so it was it was fun to come up with a bad guy. Bad guys are always interesting and always a lot of fun. So, uh, um, yeah, it, 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 it's, uh, it was neat to, it was neat to go through the design process with him. Uh, and he was also an incredibly challenging, uh, character, uh, to engineer, uh, cause he did all kinds of things. And I, we, I think we only saw a fraction of what he could actually do as a functioning puppet on screen. Like his, uh, um, you know, his missiles fired on his back. He had a, uh, an eye that telescoped in and out. Um, he had uh, flaps on his chest that would open and fire missiles. And, uh, you know, he could do all these really bizarre and interesting things. And I think we only used a handful of his uh, tricks. But, like, he had, uh, you know, he had, a, a like, a two-inch wide a gathering of cables coming out the bottom of him that were for all his different functions and stuff. So. Oh my god! And and you st yeah. you still have the puppet, don't you? Yeah, actually, yes. I, I, I it was interesting. I was uh, uh, I had renovated my uh, my home studio a few years ago, and uh, when I was moving stuff out of storage, I had completely forgotten that he was there. And it was like, oh, look at this. Uh, <laughs> Dust him out, and uh, you know, he's still he he weathered well. He's uh, well because he, he was mostly. Um, Again, I would certainly build him very differently these days with new materials, but because he was very heavy, he was uh, plastic and resin and wood and uh, and metal, and uh, you know I would be using a lot, a lot lighter material nowadays. But uh, he he's he's great. He he sits he sits. It's funny he sits right beside my 3D printer. So it's like <laughs> the advance of technology over the years. <laughs> Oh god, that's hilarious! And I'm sure you remember he was a he was a real big asshole in the show. But then there was the, oh yeah, then there was the he was in three episodes, and then yeah, there was the yeah. last there was this lovely scene in the last episode where there's a cigar salesman who wants to take over the shop, and then Disruptor says no smoking in the store, and yeah. sort of sa <laughs> saves everyone. <laughs> he, he had a change yeah. of heart for whatever reason. <laughs> Yes, yes, of course. You always have to have the, the, the happy ending. Yeah. Even for the bad guys. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, man. I, yeah. I don't know if you remember that last episode very well, but... Oh, it was... It was <gasps> Just, yeah, as soon as, you, as soon as you mentioned it, it's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I remember that. It was... But, yeah, it's, it's funny because... Um, uh, I've been I've been very grateful the fact that you've you've salvaged and found all the shows, and I've been watching them from time to time, and it's like, okay, I know I did that, but I have no recollection of doing yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well yeah, it's uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, this, I I sort of did the digitizing work, but you got to thank Rick and the Dennis yeah. in Nashville because they're the ones who kept all the stuff. Oh yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, that man, that after you know digitizing the whole second season, um, and then getting to the the end of it, it was so hard to watch that last episode. Oh, it was, it oh, was really, yeah. it was really sad, but it was like so nice as well. Yeah, it was it was bittersweet, you know. It was um, well for me, especially, you know. It uh, it was a show that really uh, helped to launch my career on a different level. Um, and uh, you know, we were uh, gosh, what was it? It was a span of three, four years. Um, yeah, about that. We did that show, so uh, you know, it was. Uh, it was it was amazing and uh, it was it was very concentrated and intense too because uh, you know the first the first season we actually shot two seasons worth of stuff almost yeah and, uh, four, forty episodes in the Christmas movie. yeah yeah and um, you know it was uh, it was great it was fantastic and you know there's aspects of it now where I look back and if you know it's always that you know hindsight twenty twenty it's like gosh if I only knew just how amazing and intense and wonderful it really was <laughs> uh, oh yeah because yeah yeah because productions like that just uh, they don't really i mean you have a handful of things now but, but productions of that scale are, are a rarity these days and i feel very fortunate that i was a part of that so yeah yeah no it 
it, it, it was a, a fantastic show, and it, it's amazing to see how far it went internationally. I don't know if I've ever shown you any of the the, the translated versions, but there are... Oh, just... yes, I've w- I watched some of them, and it just makes me laugh. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, my, oh, my God. I... To, see, to, see, yeah, to see some foreign language come out of Rusty's mouth, it's like, oh, wow, that's just weird yeah so. it's funny how they made the music and effects tracks they must have muted all the the microphones and stuff when yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well what i thought was really funny was that in israel they were still showing the dubbed version until 2015 and they the theme song they oh, did really? yeah the theme song they did was great and the, the they were still showing it a couple of years ago it's crazy oh my. you know oh my but i'm sure you know they've redesigned naughty hundreds and thousands of times oh, yeah. yet they're still yeah, showing yeah. that why can't why can't America and Canada r- bring it back? <laughs> I don't know. It would be great. It would be fantastic. I mean, I'd be happy to do yeah. to do that. There's, I mean, that's the thing these days. It's you know, reboot this, reboot that, reboot this, and. Uh, you know, I have uh, friends in the industry who are rebooting some other shows that I enjoyed watching, and I'm, I'm kind of like going, I, want to, I want to do it too. I want to help. I want to help. <laughs> you know, but it, everything's, everything's, you know, it, it, it's challenging because, um, you know, budgets are extremely tight, and uh, you know, unless you have, uh, uh, you know, unless you are connected to, you know, the broadcasters now are, you know, Netflix and Amazon and, uh, you know, and Prime. Though they're the they're the networks now, and um, you know, and there's a long lineup at their door to uh, try and say, "Hey, I got a show. I want to do it." Yeah, so. well, yeah. Well, you know, I think that naughty series, and, and I'm going to say this very carefully because uh, I don't want anyone yeah. stealing my ideas, but um, <laughs> I think that series would work really well as like a in a re- reboot form, but as a film, like a, an actual th- theatrical film. I think it would. Oh yeah. I think it would work yeah, yeah. really well. It just. Sort oh, that of, would. Be fun. Yeah, would it be just fun. it just sort of has that feel to it that you want. You know, I, I watch the episodes and I'm like, damn, I wish they'd made a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, here's a good question. I've I've wanted to ask this for a while. Um, okay. What was it like recording the music videos for the songs, like syncing up to the the tracks and stuff? Oh, that was some of my favorite stuff to do. Um, it was um, it was fun because um, you didn't necessarily have to focus on your script and your lines because everything was being played back to you. Um, often, when we're puppeteering on set and you know voicing our characters in a scene, you know we're we're crouched hidden somewhere and we've got a monitor to see what we're doing, and then we have our scripts taped up beside us, so we're you know reading and performing along, and we're um, yeah and. Uh, you know, it's fun, but you, you're multitasking to get that to happen. Whereas when we were doing the music video stuff, of course, all the voices were pre-recorded, so you're just sort of listening and reacting to doing the, the lip sync for your characters. But you can focus more on the actual physical performance of of the puppet, so you can get just that little bit more um, movement and and excitement, and of course because it's a music video you're you're either dancing or jumping up and down or doing some sort of interesting moves with the character so um my favorite one and this is one one that i got to puppeteer was the uh, uh gator gertie singing uh, tell the time oh wow yeah gospel song that we did yeah, yeah and it was it was interesting because i actually uh wayne moss who was the director mm-hmm. i told him I was like look i i want to puppeteer i want to i want to do this one i really want to do this one and they're like oh okay so they actually gave me the track, and I took Gator Gertie home, and I actually practiced a little bit and watched some uh, uh, some you know gospel stuff. I would find uh, I found some tapes of stuff, and I would watch a couple of gospel singing songs and just the movements and everything. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is fun. And then um, you know when we get on set and the music is rolling and you're just present. To the to the sound, the music, and everything, um, you kind of get lost. You don't really think about what you're doing. You're just simply doing it. And uh, when I look back at that 
uh, one particular music video uh, that we did. It was like, yeah, that was fun. And I just, wow. I, it, Gator Gertie is just basically a, a blob, <laughs> a rubber blob that, that has a mouth that opens and a head that turns, and that's it. But because I got to really play with it, it, uh, it was interesting to see just how much expression and movement I got out of this, you know, blobby shape. <laughs> now it's time. It's interesting about the songs and stuff because um, I think for some songs, depending on, you know, because Dennis, from what he's told me about when he wrote the songs in Nashville, he would, you know, he'd be writing one song, he'd be demoing another one, and then he'd be recording the final mix with all the singers, like, in one day, and he, he wouldn't sleep for yeah. three days. Now, yeah. I think for some songs, he actually had to send versions where it was, it was the final instrumental, but it was him singing to them. Do you recall ever? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, there were, yeah, there were a few like that, and that was, that was always entertaining, because, uh, you know, you have, you know, a suppose, supposedly a female voice singing, and then it was Dennis's voice that would come out and say, oh, that, uh, that sounds a little weird, but... <laughs> As long as, as long as the lips are flapping in the right spots, we're okay. Yeah, so. yeah. No, I've heard all of the original the original demos, but what I, what Dennis, I don't I don't think he ever kept the versions where they were like, uh, reference mixes. I think they were called where they were the final instrumental, but with him singing them. Now, yeah, I've got a collection of DA eighty eight format digital tapes, which I think has one. One set of twenty-five reference mixes. I'm hoping that's what they are because because oh those will be really funny to hear. Oh goodness, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I might, I might somewhere. Who knows? I might in a bin somewhere. Actually, have a have an audio cassette of a couple of songs. Oh god. We, <laughs> we get we get audio cassettes from time to time to to practice some of them, the more complex songs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that that would be really cool if you found those to get those transferred. Yeah, I don't. I, I doubt Dennis would have any of those pre-mixes still around, considering I've been through his archive before. <laughs> um, uh, God. Um, oh yeah, because he used to deliver the 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 final mixes on a format called DAT tape, digital audio. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. Um, going through his archive, the one thing I found which you might find really interesting was it was actually not his tape. It, was sent from the editing studio in Canada and it was pre-singing audition so what it was it was a type of <laughs> improvised you guys all the puppeteers doing improvised voices for the the puppets which were then oh, used oh as a gosh. used as a guide for the to, you know to find yeah. the singers and yeah, yeah I'll send you a copy of that because it's really funny it's it's oh I'm sure it would be <laughs> you know just again it's like, okay, guys, improvise something. Okay, you realize you've just opened the gates and released the Kraken. We are going to do <laughs> some very naughty things now. Uh, all, I, so. all I remember was, I think, Stein, which I think I think you voiced him, actually. Yeah. yeah. And he, I remember yeah. him going saying some really, really crazy stuff. And then <laughs> Frank... Uh, oh, yeah, I don't know if you remember, but in some of the early episodes, Frank sort of gave Warlow a, a deeper voice, and he sounded really yes. weird. Yeah, and yeah. in that he's in this tape, he's got this really deep voice. It's still sort of Warlow's voice, but it's really deep and it's strange. Yeah, and in that yeah, he's yeah. it's really funny because he's reading a naughty script, but it's the one of the child actors lines. He's reading as the child actor in Warlow's voice, and it's <laughs> it's the greatest thing. Oh, cool. God, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I just I f I'd forgotten to mention that to you, but I'll I'll have to send that to you at some point. Yeah, that would be that would be great to, to see. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yep. So, did you have a favorite character episode or favorite song from the show? Oh goodness. Um, yeah, people always ask me that. You know, it's it's hard to it's hard to really say um, 
which character I, I think the, well the one character that I got to play with the most and did the most sort of physical stuff with was Rusty and uh, it was a lot of fun to play him because uh, he was a very different in that he was a full body puppet so I was always rigging him to stand or be sitting on something and uh, you know and finding interesting ways to perform him uh, so yeah so he would be he would be my favorite Disrupto was a lot of fun too. Like again, playing the bad guy, uh, it was it was really fun to to, to be him. Um, but as for songs, gosh, it, it's almost a blur. Uh, we did so many. Ninety nine, um, exactly. Oh my goodness! You know, it um, it, it was. Uh, it's hard to pick out just well again. Uh, the again the the tell the time with Gator Gertie that was just one that I I. In, I enjoyed doing um, because it was a, a, a chance for me just to really just focus on the performance, and that was fun. Um, but, but gosh, yeah, like it, I think for me, what I enjoyed the most were some of the songs where we had to make all kinds of extra props for. Like there was one where uh, Rusty makes a car wash for Rusty and Sherman. Yeah, uh, yep, there was. Yep. Uh, you know, there was a parade one that we did. So it was, it was making all the extra accoutrements um, to go along with the songs. I think it was part of what I really enjoyed too, because the whole idea when we went into the songs was it was that extra level of quote, imaginary things. So being able to make the unusual props and bits and pieces to go along with that were great oh for, for sure and i know yeah. when you mentioned those props i knew exactly which songs you're talking about so yeah. so um you know it's funny as well with dennis he has this really really distinct style where all his songs are almost all of them are broadway sort of style but they're all yeah. they're all different genres now yeah my favorite <laughs> my favorite one that i can think of at the moment um it was a song called uh was an episode where warlow I don't know, I can't remember the exact context, he made this really disgusting cake, and then he had this full-on Broadway number, in th a three-part oh, three Broadway yes. number. And, um, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm sure you remember what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. God, that was just such a bizarre concept. It was a, 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 a yeah. really intense Broadway song in three parts about cake. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 the, some of the silliness of it all was just brilliant you know it was so much fun strike up the band bring on the bake try some warlow wonder cake friends it's absolutely free have a little cake on me uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, Blah. Ew, this, this cake, cake is, is the worst. worst quick something to drink hey first things first give me your money all that you've got the cake was free but the drink is not who's next in line <laughs> so there was one one thing that we did. Now again, you have to remember when we did this show, uh, things like you know enhancing stuff with computer graphics and whatnot. That just that just didn't happen. That didn't exist. So a lot of what we did was as practical as possible on set. And one of the coolest things we did. So there was one song where um, uh, Johnny Crawfish's tank freezes. Oh god, uh, yeah. that's the one with, with uh, I think that was the one with Gilbert Godfrey. Yes, yep. yeah, yeah. So, what we did, and it was amazing, so it was coordination on everybody's part, and what we did was, um, we had, uh, uh, again, all the, it was a multi-camera shoot, so we had different things, so we had a camera set up on Johnny Crawfish's area, then we had a, one on set, so we were doing the composition of things live, to tape and the idea was there was this stuff and I haven't found it since but it was a, a spray on um, uh, a liquid that you would spray onto a surface and then once it dried it would give you that frosted effect where, where frost would grow but it was kind of cool because you could spray it on quickly and then hit it with a hair dryer to dry it and it would and it would crystallize so we had coordinated this whole end of the shoot, the whole end of the saw where, where his tank freezes. Um, so I'm on the practical set, um, just below the tank with the spray and a hairdryer. And uh, 
then we had uh, you know all the cameras synced up and stuff, and we and we did it in one take where um, song ends, da, 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 Johnny Johnny freezes. I quickly I spray the, the the tank and then I hit it with a hairdryer and we caught it all on camera and the tank freezes up and it was just this bizarre um, thing of co everybody being coordinated just and the timing was just perfect and the effect worked and that to me was that was one of my favorite memories of the technical stuff that we did on set oh god yeah that, I always always wondered about that little scene because small you know practical effects stand out to me like that like I, I remember when I watched the episode for the first time aside from finding it really funny because it was Gilbert Godfrey um, yeah. I, that that particular little shot stood out to me, so it's really cool to hear the little backstory there. Yeah, yeah, and there was there was a lot of that kind of stuff that we that we did, but that was the one that really stands out to me too. And it was just because it was the pressure was on because I was the one that thought up, oh, here's how we could do it, and I'm like, oh crap, I hope this works. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you know, everybody's waiting, waiting. Is it gonna work? Is it gonna work? And you know. Again, the fact that we did it and did one take, it's like, yes, it worked. Awesome. So, oh, yeah. yeah so that was that was a lot of fun. And, and that was a bizarre episode. Who, I want to know what, which writer and, and, and who, whose idea it was, you know, to say, ah, oh, imagine if we got Gilbert Godfrey to be Jack Frost and he just runs around really small on the, in, around the shop. I honestly, <laughs> I don't know. I think part of it too is, um, you know, because we had so many different celebrity guests, and uh, I think part of it was, and no offense to any of them, it was just part of, okay, who can we get? Who, who's available? Who, who, who could actually do this? And it, it was kind of a bit of a, uh, you know, a dice shoot to see who was available when we were planning on shooting that particular episode to come in and, and do it. So, uh, yeah, there were a few other there were a few other actors that um, were mentioned. Um, but uh, it, it never worked out. Uh, I think actually, I think Paula Abdul was one of the actors who was supposed to be a guest star, but it never happened. So, uh, oh. yeah. I mean, they got some pretty notable names on there. Um, they, oh gosh, yeah. Betty White. That that's crazy. Yes, that's my favorite. That's my favorite story because, uh, you know, I, I got to, I got to sit and have lunch with Betty White and hang out with Betty White for. For a couple of days, and it, you know, it's my 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 favorite celebrity story because she was absolutely wonderful and just saucy and oh, yeah. just yeah, you know, she, she was uh, she was a complete gem and a sweetheart. Yeah, and oh gosh, she flirted. Oh god. <laughs> what I find fascinating is the uh, you know all the kids on the show who have gone on to build amazing careers for themselves. I mean, Katie for one. I mean, it's oh yeah, it's hysterical. Like, you know, I'm sitting watching a TV show the other night, and it's like, oh my goodness, I know that person. Yeah. My goodness, he's grown up. Oh, no, wow. I know. They've, you know. they've all done it so well. It makes me feel really old. <laughs> yeah, well, they've, they've all done so well for themselves, and obviously you know that, you know, um, child actors don't always, you know, go on to do good things, but they've, yeah. they've stayed in the industry yeah. and they've done so well. Oh, yeah, and then, you know, it's... I'm very proud and excited to, to see that because you know it is it's a it's a it, it can be a very ruthless industry especially for uh, for kids you know it's um it, you know it, it it's it can be brutal and grueling and you know expectations are placed on you and pressures are placed on you and uh, you know that when when all the uh, when all the young actors were kids on set. Uh, you know they did they did really well i mean of course there are days where you know everybody's tired or everybody's uh completely buzzed on soft drinks uh, or something and just running around like in a complete hyper yeah uh, you know tizzy as it were yeah um reel them in but um you know it, it's funny because you know being a dad myself now it's just like yeah you see the signs you recognize the signs yep the kids are tired Let's uh, see if we can just get this and go home. Yeah, so. it's it's like you know, back to the, the the puppetry stuff. I think they used to shoot the the kids stuff in the morning, and then the puppets would come back in the afternoon, and yeah. then then they'd shoot the Johnny stuff at night. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's that's the way our production days usually would go. We would be on set 
during the mornings when they would do the 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 adults and the kids and the kid actors on set and we were kind of on standby so that if there was a shot where oh we're seeing this puppet in the background let's give it a bit of life uh, uh, so we were always on standby as puppeteers during that bit and that's usually when I would also just be working on uh, building props and other things for other other episodes uh, and then we'd have lunch and then we would usually wrap up the kids sometime just after lunch and then it would be more the um, all the adult scenes with all the adult actors uh, and then some of the puppets and then they would finish up and then it would just be all puppets for the rest of the day so uh, yeah so it, it was an interesting um, it was an interesting schedule and it was funny because what would happen sometimes um, you know we'd have to work late into the evening to get stuff ready for the following day so in those mornings where we were sort of on standby to puppeteer uh, on set you know they would stick us in a uh, you know, a bookshelf or something to puppeteer, and oftentimes we'd be we'd be falling asleep, just <laughs> snoozing on set, waiting waiting for a cue, you know. And sometimes, uh, more more often than not, people would forget we were in there. Oh, I'm just sure. Kind of I'm sure. Break for lunch. It's like, uh, oh, where's Jim? Oh, he's still in the cupboard. Oh, <laughs> we should go let him out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that 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 brings me to another question. What were where were the? I imagine there were a lot of holes like in the set in on the oh yeah on the in the the, yeah. the counter and that. I always wondered how the hell they did that because it's so dis yeah it's so the, perfectly. so yeah so the way the way it worked so the, the walls were actually all uh, hollow. There was a there was a uh, there was a gap between the walls and the, the back walls of the of the shop, so we could actually get in behind all the bookshelves and all the things there in Puppeteer. Uh, the counters, of course, were that little bit extra taller and deeper, so we had a lot of room to Puppeteer under there. And then there were also the uh, islands of shelves yep, yep. Uh, out in the middle of the shop, and those were hollow, and we would, oftentimes, that's where we would be locked into. So there's there was that. Um, yeah, so... so when you would see a full shot, you would see the when you would see the floor or a wide shot, we were often hidden in you know some compartment somewhere that way. Um, but when it was just the puppets, uh, we were just basically playing the bottom of frame of camera. So we would actually be out on set on rolly chairs and stuff to uh, to puppeteer. So that's uh, that's how that's how it worked for us. Yeah, no, that's 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 fascinating. And, and as you mentioned the schedules earlier, um, I've actually got these really weird rough edits of the music videos where it tells you what time of day it was when they were shooting it. It's yeah. it, it, it just it's just it goes from nine a.m. when the kids are there, and then it's you know twelve, and it's the shot of the penguins, and then it's all of a sudden it's six o'clock, and there's Johnny Crawfish. I'm like, oh, that's that's late. Yeah. <laughs> But that's that's yeah. how I worked it out because I've got those, and I sort of assumed yeah. those that those must have been the times they shot it. And it's oh yeah, it's weird because it's down to the second as well. So I can look at that shot and go, oh, they they shot that at this exact second. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, we always shoot it late into the night some nights, and uh, you know it. Uh, that's just the nature of the industry is you kind of work until uh, you get stuff done as best you can, and. Um, uh, you know, fortunately, it, I was I was young and full of energy at that point, so it wasn't that difficult to do. Oh yeah, so, well, you know, it you looked know. like a fun show too. Oh, it was, and and you know, what was most amazing about it was the uh, just the people involved and everybody you worked directly with. There was a sense of camaraderie and uh, a sense of uh, just family in that regard, and. Uh, it's it's interesting because a lot of the productions that I've been involved with uh, since uh, there's always that um, that uh, phenomenon where you're all kind of in a pressure cooker together and you all sort of work together with a common goal of getting things done and then uh, it's over it dissipates and everybody kind of goes off to the you know, four corners of the earth and, and sort of scattered to the wind and you don't necessarily maintain connection with with people 
Uh, but uh, you know, I still do maintain some connections with uh, the friends that I made working on that show, and uh, you know, touch base with them from time to time. And it's nice to to see how you know their lives have evolved and moved forward. And uh, and again, like like I said, even like the the, the kid actors who aren't kids anymore, and uh, seeing them and what they've done, it's uh, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Oh, I can imagine. It, it really. I don't know, every time I watch the show, I'm like, damn, I wish I could visit that set, but then, oh, I'm sure you know, um, Rick told me the tragic story of what they did with the set when they were done. Oh, I, yeah. I don't like, yeah. He actually tried to hide that from me because he thought it would, uh, it would upset <laughs> me, and I'm like, Rick, you, you were right to hide that from me, I didn't need to know that. Yeah. <laughs> but yep. it is great. Big bonfire. Oh. Big bonfire. Oh, there yeah. You go. Well, I think he still has the sign from the front of the shop. So I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. that's great. That's great. But all right. So the 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 tell me a bit about the the puppet performance. So like, wh which characters did you voice and operate, and sort of what? Uh, so yeah. So I voiced and operated Rusty, Lichtenstein, uh, Disrupto. Oh, uh, Disrupto. I thought so. Yeah. Uh, gosh, who else? Um. There's some other ones in there. Can't think of them now. Uh, throw some, throw some characters at me because I got. Oh, <laughs> there were so many. I mean, they're, they're all the background ones. You got the penguins. Did you? Oh yeah. So yeah, we would do. We would do. I would do the odd penguin and. Uh, um. Uh, gosh, what other ones? Oh, jo um, oh, Johnny Crawfish. Don't forget. Oh yeah, Johnny. Well, yeah, Johnny was a two-person operation. So I was, I did his claws, yes. and Jimmy Rankin did his voice. So we were kind of a, we were Siamese twins when it came to performing him. Yeah. Um, and then, then yeah, there, then there was just a lot of extra extraneous characters, and especially when we did like the fairy tale songs, you know, we would kind of do the odd little voice for for them. So. Oh God, the fairy tale songs. The videos for those are really, they're really surreal because they're. Puppets in Noreen's traditional style, but they're like set to two D backgrounds. They're really, really interesting. Yeah, they had they they did they definitely had like a okay, what are you smoking kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah. Feel, to, feel to them because yeah. they were very ethereal and they did sort of like they did sort of go off on their own little um, tangent of reality as it were. Um, but they they were they were fun to perform because they were because they were just that little bit weird and trippy and different. Oh yeah. So well, that, that's what I sort of liked about them. The characters all looked they, they they all looked so strange, but in a really like a really good way. Like yeah, I, I'm fascinated yeah. by the the sort of the art style of yourself and Noreen. Yeah. yeah. Um. All right. Well, actually, no. Just just quickly. Do, can you yeah. still do the any? Can you still do the, the the main three voices that you did? Oh yeah, well, well Rusty's always sort of here, like that, <laughs> like that there. <laughs> and Disruptor, Disruptor was down here, <laughs> like this. And Lichtenstein was really there. He's just he was my Arnold uh, impersonation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think he talked very often. I think. No, not very often. He would just have the occasional one-line joke here and there. That, I mean, that's what he was. He was just a throwaway joke. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, he was fun to perform. Yeah. So, so yeah, it was... Uh, they, they were fun times, that's for sure. And uh, it, it's kind of like... It's kind of like reminiscing about high school in many ways, you know, so... Well, well kind of quite literally, because you told me you were just out of high school. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was I was quite young when uh, when we did uh, when we did that show. I was in my uh, early twenties, so uh, wow. yeah, yeah, it was a uh, it was a freaky time. But you know, it, I, again, I'm I'm very fortunate. Um, you know, I worked hard at it uh, to get my foot in the door with uh, uh, with the industry. But um, I was very fortunate that for me in my career, I I got in at a time when productions like Naughty and some of the other things I've been involved with were happening, you know, and uh, there were budgets and there were uh, reasons and uh, demand for the kind of work. So, you know, I would do, I did Naughty, then I would go and do some commercial work and then I would do some movie work and then I would do another show, then I'd be back on Naughty and then I'd 
traveled overseas to do commercial work and stuff. So, you know, it, it was a, a glut of work and opportunity that uh, happened at that moment in time that I, again, I touch wood, I feel very fortunate that uh, uh, that was what happened in my reality, as it were. And, um, you know, and it's interesting because uh, nowadays, uh, all these tools that are available to any aspiring artist or performer uh, are fantastic. You know, we have YouTube, we have Vimeo, we have a means to get a product out to people. And from the production side of thing too, we have all these tools at our disposal. I mean, I can shoot and edit a video on my phone. Oh, yeah. Whereas, you know, <laughs> when I started in the industry, um, you know, uh, I was shooting stuff in a studio and then you needed a room full of reel to reel tapes to then edit your show together, you know, and uh, it's fascinating to see how, and again, like I was saying earlier about just the materials and the tools that I use now to fabricate characters is very different. Um, you know, so there are all these tools at our disposal, which is phenomenal. Um, but like to my experience, uh, I had an opportunity to be mentored by a great person, a great artist, a great performer and builder, Noreen. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate to find a mentor to teach me the skill set that I need. It's one thing to have the tools, but it's the other thing to have the know-how and the experience to use those tools. So for me, what I'm hoping to do now, I'm always, if anybody is interested in this craft and learning these things, I'm always like, you know, look, my studio door is open. You can come talk to me. I'm happy to share my experience and show, uh, you know, ways of which, you know, ways of creating things and bringing ideas to life. Uh, something that I really enjoy doing. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's just sort of uh, my, maybe my little um, voice of going, saying to anybody who is interested in doing any kind of creative work you know there there are people out there who uh can mentor you and teach you you just have to put the effort into connecting to people and the fact that you can connect with almost anybody now um online again like i said when i started in the industry i was writing letters and i was making long distance phone calls on an actual phone that was stuck to a wall yeah. that didn't go in the pocket you know and uh so I, I just think it's important that in this day and age of, quote, day and age of, quote, communication, that's something that we actually need to work on is how we communicate and connect with each other. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, it's it's funny you say that because I'll send you the link to it. With, but my, in my interview with Dennis, he talks about how he got the job with Rick, and it's the funniest story. He, 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 yeah. he told me he constantly sent Rick his resume. He, he sent it yeah. three times a day or something. Until Rick said, okay, we're going to trial this guy. But Rick tells the story differently. He says that his his wife found a tape of Dennis's work, a ch children's song thing, and said, this is really good, we should audition this guy. But but Rick, Rick Dennis tells it differently. He's like, no, I badgered the hell out of Rick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't know which to believe, but either way, <laughs> we got some fantastic songs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Do you... I've got to ask this now, it's come to me. Oh, see, this is what happens. Yeah. I, I get all these hundreds of thousands of questions which branch off. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you remember particularly anything about shooting the, the title sequence, the theme song? Oh, gosh. Yeah, that was... Uh, that was fun. That was, that was a challenging thing because we tried to get as many characters as possible animated uh within uh a certain scene especially like the opening window yeah uh shot so uh i think i had well we each had like two we all had two puppets on like one in each hand and of course some puppets require two hands for you to to puppeteer so it was a little tricky and i think um i, I forget which characters i had on um but we were all crammed in underneath the the window uh the front window of the shop and so there's basically that ledge uh that's piled full of toys and, and puppets and characters and 
that honestly i think that was the one spot that we we loathed trying to get into because it was just that extra bit of low there was a lot of there was there wasn't as much headspace and i have pictures i will definitely have to get them out for you of how we had to contort ourselves and fold ourselves over one another and basically when you're a professional puppeteer uh, deodorant is a, a must. Oh, you know, oh, oh, I've gathered. I've gathered, yeah. Because, you know, you got your, your face in somebody else's armpit and, you know, somebody's foot up beside your head. We were we were folded and crammed into that one spot. Oh, my God. And uh, I can't remember how many takes we did. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I recall that aspect of when we had to shoot the opening scene. Yeah, yeah well, the, the theme song was interesting in that for the first season, it was actually one of the last songs written. Yeah. 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 I, I know that there was a whole thing where Rick wasn't sure what he wanted for it, and he, he told me, he said to me some very wise words. He says, when you make a show, make sure you do the theme song last. And I was like, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And actually, yeah, we also, um, we we shot the first episode first. Yes. And then much more. And then we then went back and reshot the first episode because we had, by that point, established the characters and the feel and the pace of the show, which was a very brilliant thing to do because um, I'm sure, I don't know if any of the actual recordings of the very first episode we shot first whoa, still exist. Whoa, whoa. That's, a, that's, that's uh, kind of like a, not exactly, but almost like a pilot version. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, so... so so, um, you know, so the first episode was probably one of the last things we actually shot because we had, uh, at that point, had established the characters and the pace and the feel. So uh, when people were introduced to the show, we already knew who we were as characters and, and, and story. So Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. That's, cr- that's crazy. I, I never knew that because I remember asking Rick if they'd ever done a pilot and he said, no, we just did the, the first episode. I'm like, that makes sense. But now that you mention that, and having watched that episode hundreds of thousands of times, and I've even watched it in Polish, um, yeah. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense that you mention that. That's now now you've yeah, now you've sent me on a crazy hunt to find the rough cut of that episode. Yeah, there you go. There, there, there's your next quest. Um, I'm just praying that exists somewhere. <laughs> oh, I'm sure, I'm sure it does somewhere. I'm sure it does. Somewhere. Yeah, because yeah. I don't know if you know, but DreamWorks own Naughty now, and we d- we yeah. don't know what they have in terms of archival stuff. I'm I'm hoping they kept everything they inherited from the other companies. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, who knows? The, who, who knows? Exactly. <laughs> and the, the naughty rights are a mess. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Um, I'm gonna have to. Be, oh, let's just hope I'm rich in ten years so I can buy naughty off DreamWorks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, there was a fantastic episode in the first season. A new fish, George, is introduced into Johnny Crawfish's tank. Oh, goodness, with yeah. some interesting results. Tell me a little about George. I feel this is going to be a good story. Yeah, so George the fish <laughs> was actually a one of the first latex puppets I ever made in high school. So he was he he already existed, and I think uh, Rick saw him and said, "Oh, we got to use him. We got to do something with him." And um, uh, so we so. George was introduced into the show, and, and yes, and actually, yeah, I had completely forgotten that we had used George, um, and I voiced him as well. So he was sort of in there like that. Oh, that was the oh God, his voice. And, <laughs> um, so yeah, so so he was the antagonist to uh, to Johnny Crawfish for an episode. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so that was that was kind of fun to to bring in a a puppet that I had just I had just made for fun, you know, basically, and he got. Uh, thrown in the mix and used and it was fun too because i made a i ended up sculpting a little mini version of it so when uh dan redican who played uh um the fellow who owned it yeah, yeah. it's this tiny little mini version of of the, of the character in the you know his little jar oh yeah like i remember this. that yeah no, I, re- I remember watching that episode and looking at the puppet and going what is that but it you, you told me, I think you said that was one of the first puppets you ever built. That, that's 
Yeah, that's amazing. And and I think you said at some point you still had the puppet. Do you still have? Oh yeah, yeah. He's actually yeah. He's uh, he sits in the. Uh, I work uh, I work as an animator and illustrator at a production company. So he's actually sitting on a shelf at the office there. Oh, God. Um, you know, at the time. So so some some of the puppets have have, have had some longevity. That's for sure. Oh, so. and there we go. The irony again. Poor Johnny. He really did have a. Yeah. He did have a <laughs> depressing fate because I'm sure you remember the song where they sort of had a a Broadway number where they sort of you know try and better one another and uh, yeah and oh also yeah Johnny yeah, Johnny yeah. ended up uh, getting the short end of the stick. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um, do you know where some of the puppets are now? Well, I know what happened with some of the puppets. I have some of them. I got some of them back. So I do have some of the puppets uh, sitting in my shop. Again, I've got Rusty and Sherman sitting on a shelf. I've got Disrupto um, hanging out here. Um, and then I th think like characters like Warlow went to Frank Meshkalite. Oh, God. Uh, and, uh, you know, and again, like Jim, Jim Rankin inherited some of the characters, like I said, with... Uh, like he got, uh, he got Johnny, but again, that story of... Johnny's poor fate of being covered in bubbles and having the bubbles <laughs> dissolve the puppet over time. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, and I know, yeah, Rick got some of them as well. So, I, yeah, they kind of got scattered here and there. Um, where all of them are, I don't know, but I know I have a couple back and uh, a few people have some of them. So, uh, you, you know, yeah, it's kind of, you know, yeah. every, everything sort of scattered to the wind as it were yeah and i'm just hoping that uh you know uh the johnny is the only one who sort of you know disappeared because um they're all great and it is a shame that you know at, at least one of them no longer exists i mean i'm hoping that the rest of them yeah are I, I, yeah i don't i don't know because again like some of the materials we used at the time again a lot of stuff was latex and and foam and that stuff does deteriorate over time so i it, you know if, even if stuff is sitting in a bin somewhere it could potentially just be mush <laughs> now but um yeah, you know, it's it uh, it's it's kind of funny to to think about that. And I've had the experience where you know I've built stuff, used it, and then you know sold it off, and it goes out there somewhere. And then I'll be watching a parade or something, and it's like, oh my goodness, there's a alien puppet I made for something years ago, and it's on a float now. It's like, oh, okay, oh, all right, God. that's weird. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that is that is kind of funny. You know, I've I've always I look around on on sites on on auction sites just in case you know one of them shows up for some reason, <laughs> and I just I think it's great that the original performers have retained them because yeah yeah we we held yeah. held on to some of them yeah, yeah. yeah. and then you said Frank kept Warlow yeah I believe so I think Frank has Warlow and. Um... I'm not sure what other characters he might have, but uh, yeah, they and, and I think Noreen, Noreen Young inherited some of the characters back as well. Oh, she, she, she's 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 got yeah. all. I've I've actually spoken to Noreen. She's a great, gr oh, good. great, um, a great uh, person, great, great performer, great puppet builder, and all that. Um, she has Granny yeah. Duck, and then all of those really funny fairy tale characters. All of them. Oh yeah. Every single one oh, of them. I do have yeah, I do actually. No, I do have one of the fairy tale characters, though. I've got the frog. Oh my god, you that, have the frog! <laughs> yeah, that was using it, and um, it's funny because uh, uh, he was a he was a silly thing to, to puppeteer because he was just this floppy foam thing that was just kind of thrown together at the last minute. So um, yeah, so he still sits on a shelf downstairs. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's oh, it's still it's cool that you have that. I remember, I remember that song really well. It's a uh, oh god, <laughs> those puppet fairy tale songs were so strange. They were, yeah, they were, they were definitely trippy. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, um, do you have any funny sort of memories from Noddy? Any funny stories that you might like to sort of tell us about? Oh god, I'm sure there's, I'm yeah. sure there's several. If there, there were a lot. Some of them I, I don't think I could actually publicly say because they would be just too punchy. Yeah. But I do remember. Oh, 
God, I do remember one episode. Um, so uh, the Crybabies uh, were puppeteered by Jim Rankin and myself. And uh, Jim is notorious for passing gas. Oh, God. Uh, and, and uh, of course, so we were locked into this little um, island that the Crybabies are on. And I think we both were actually not in the best of health that one day. And we were both farting like crazy. And it was just, I think we were, became completely oxygen deprived in this tiny little set, you know, piece, <laughs> the island that we were on. So, so we were doing the recording and of course we're in there because the kids are running around and doing stuff around us. And we were just sort of in the background, but we were locked into this thing. And I just remember kind of almost being completely delirious and giggling because we were so oxygen deprived and how, how foul the stench was in this in this this tiny little cubicle. And then uh, we break for lunch, and of course they crack it, they crack the seal open to let us out, and like everybody had to stand back. Oh my god! It was just so it was just so rank, and we both sort of <laughs> fell out of the giggling, going, "Oh my god! I can't believe we just did that!" <laughs> oh so, Christ, uh, that's hilarious. Yeah. So that was definitely one of the more <laughs> memorable scenarios. Oh God, I can imagine yeah. that. That that's a yeah. that's a lovely story. <laughs> so I've I, I um kind of neglected this part of the the uh, thing, so I'm going to bring it up now. Um, Ace Ace yeah. Lightning was an amazing show. So so tell me about yes. tell me about your your experiences, how you became involved, and the character design and that sort of stuff. Oh yeah, well that was that was a fun and interesting project, um, you know, and it, it was kind of ahead of its time. So after Naughty, uh, Rick had approached me to do some design work for the, you know for Ace and uh, coming up with uh, you know looks and designs and feel for these characters and uh, basically kind of gave me carte blanche to really play and experiment and uh, it was a lot of fun to dream up these you know, video game type characters that had everything sort of mixed together that I loved, you know, carnivals and video games and monsters. Um, so mixing all of them up together was a lot of fun and drawing on even just some of the characters that uh, I had thought up years ago, um, like Lord Fear, who's the lead bad guy in it, was yeah. a character idea that I had for a long time that actually kind of came to me in a bit of a nightmare that I had. Oh, God. And, yeah, he, uh, he was freaky. Yeah. yeah, so this weird idea of this skeletal-like thing with these deep, weird eyes and this elongated head and, and whatnot, he was a lot of fun to, uh, to design. Um, yeah, and it was an interesting process, too, because... Um, uh, you know, we created this whole sort of mythology for these characters and and their universe and where they came from. Most of which, of course, we never really got into the show itself, but there were aspects of it that we did. Um, but uh, yeah, that was uh, that was a really fun creative process to to dream up these these characters um, and you know even just come up with their names and and who they were were a lot of fun. Oh yeah. And Ace Lightning in particular was an interesting um, show in that it went through a lot of changes. Like you know, I'm sure you remember it was originally called Captain Lightning, and and yep. then yep. Ace, then they called it Ace Lightning and the Carnival of Doom, and then Rick settled with Ace Lightning. Yeah, and, and then yeah. He, it, uh, yeah, yeah, went through a number of iterations for sure. And then even before that, he was supposed to be a comic book character. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it. Uh, <laughs> It, it evolved it evolved a, a number of different ways and um, you know even the look of, of ace lightning again at one point when he was captain lightning went through a lot of different looks and uh, designs for him and uh, I think the final design uh, sort of ended up being um, I kind of drew a, a self-portrait as it were of me wearing like a leather jacket and some body armor and that's the uh, the overall look and feel of where the final character ended up, yeah, which was uh, which was a lot of fun. So uh, 
Yeah, and again, we were we were kind of ahead of the curve in that too because um, uh, nowadays, you know, uh, you know, I could design something digitally and actually then send that off to animators to use. But when we we did that, I would design and then I sculpt these little maquettes of the characters, oh, and yeah. I have some of those oh, yeah. now. And that was so that the animators had a reference to build the characters on. So, uh, you know, it, it's one of those processes where, you know, I had a lot more sort of design detail and texture to them, but given, you know, time and budget, uh, you know, the designs had to be simplified to some degree um, and stuff like, you know, pig face had a lot more sort of grit and slime and, and disgusting detail to them and that got sort of smoothed out a little bit and, oh yeah uh, you know and uh, you know anvil was uh, a fun character but his mechanical arm with his anvil hand had a lot more gears and and, and mechanical parts and that kind of got simplified um, just due to you know, you know what they could do with CG at the time and it was interesting too because um, we were attempting to try and do things like, um, uh, you know, I would kind of be an off-screen performer uh, to to voice some of the characters and give sort of motion reference to the characters. And uh, of course, now nowadays you have actors who basically are on camera with motion sensors on them uh, performing for the characters. So we were kind of in that weird gray area where we were doing that well before what's almost a commonplace special effect thing now um so it was kind of interesting to be on the cusp of that technology oh yeah you know and didn't you stand in as like the the sort of visual stand in for the characters yeah you know? it's just yeah so i'd stand i would stand in as the majority of the characters and then uh, you know and i got to voice a couple of the characters i ended up actually being the actual puppets for the uh, for googler's character which was kind of a fun oh, thing to oh do oh god yeah he's he was he was so. scary i think he was the scariest villain yeah he was he was a fun character to design but yeah we we kind of even even how edgy he was on the show, uh, we reeled him in a bit because uh, I think he was a little bit even more insane and darker than what uh, actually ended up being oh, God. being done set. So yeah, yeah. So that was, it was fun. It was fun to design those characters for sure. Oh yeah, no, they they were they were great, and I think uh, you might know as well. Rick still has some of the maquettes, so I've seen those in person and. The... Yeah, actually, Rick was kind enough. He sent a few of them back to me because it's like, uh, you know, I'd forgotten uh, about half of half of the stuff that I've you know, made and gotten out the door for years. Oh, yeah. And I know, uh, uh, I know that they actually made some toys based on the character designs. And I, oh, those... I, yeah, I'm kicking myself. I wish I had some. You know, those... if anybody out there is listening and has actually Ace Lightning toys that exist. I'd love to have some. Those are very, <laughs> very rare. I've been looking for those on eBay for yeah. years, and and the yeah. the main ones never come up. It's always the side characters, which is weird, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. Even then, it's like ah, I'd love to have an anvil or pig face toy. <laughs> yeah, no, they 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 were such they were such great great little characters, and well, uh, I hope yeah. you find a set of them. When you were designing the sort of character, the puppets for Noddy, did you use the? Uh, I think they sort of matched in style with the the original stop motion characters which they had on set. Yeah, we had, there were definitely flavors of of things that we had to carry over again, like the color palette and some of the textures and uh, some of the proportions of the character, like you know, like their big heads and their and their body shapes and stuff. So we we tried to honor that aesthetic when uh, creating the puppets for the shop itself yeah 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 no because i think i told you rick gave me one of the originals from the stop motion series one of those yeah characters. that's cool that's amazing yeah, th yeah that's that's the pride of my naughty shelf i have a whole i have a whole <laughs> bookcase dedicated to naughty <laughs> oh cool. Yeah. cool that's cool. gonna be a pain in the butt when i move to america <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So, so in conclu in conclusion, uh, do you have any comments about Noddy in retrospect? Oh, in in retrospect for Noddy, um, it was you know I I look at it as it was a fantastic uh, moment in time uh, that I feel very grateful to have been a part of. 
you know, I got to uh, perform and design and build some great characters and work with some amazing people, um, you know, and uh, likes of which, you know, it, are, are memories for me that will be cherished you know, through, for the rest of my life. Because it really was a magical and interesting and amazing experience on so many levels. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I feel very, very fortunate that that, that happened to me. And, I, and uh, I only hope that if anybody is out there in, uh, you know, trying to pursue their dreams and the things that they love to do and their passions, that they, they have an experience that, you know, is even maybe 10% as amazing and close to what, uh, what I got to experience working on, on naughty with all those amazing people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, um, and it, 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 it always reinforces to me the fact that, you know, there are amazing things out there and there are amazing uh, experiences out there for people. Um, and there is a lot of good in this world and, uh, it definitely was a good and positive thing to be a part of. So I'm very happy about all that. Oh, that, that's awesome. And, and that's that's a really really cool message so so um thanks very much for your time matt it was awesome to have you on oh thank you it was it was great to sort of reflect and reminisce on uh on something that uh you know was really important and uh fantastic for me to be a part of yeah all right well, i'll see you guys later yeah awesome thank you